a theme of the meetings that we have chose was turning hearts based on Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. That before the great and terrible day of the Lord, Elijah, and we understand it to be the message of Elijah, the purpose of which was to turn the father, the heart of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. We're going to emphasize that last aspect in this presentation today. First of all, the fathers of our Adventist movement. And we're going to look at, uh, going to uh, focus on what they believed and uh, how long they believed. It was amazing to me to, to just learn this in the last few years. I was sheltered. Do you think I was sheltered uh, accidentally? Or I'm, I'm wondering why. I went through all of our schools from great kindergarten, cradle roll, uh, grade school, academy, uh, college, university, escaped me, all this history, where, what we used to believe. And um, I want to make a confession tonight, it's like Paul did, uh, confessing to you that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Amen. So the word is the basis of our belief. And God speaks to us through the written word and we experience the living word as the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus to each of our hearts. As he speaks to us, as he spoke to the prophets of old, we can have that same experience. Acts 24, 14. Shall, shall we kneel at this time? Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you again. We're so privileged to know about you, for which is uh, to us life eternal. And we want to know you more and more. And we want to know your Son. And as we open your word, as we study our history, we ask that you will be here in, our, in your spirit to speak to us, to guide us, that we may not only understand and know, but be drawn to you ever closer, every day, every moment, and that we will be able to share with others what we have learned, that your power of your spirit will make its change in our lives so that we can be like you. That's our prayer this, this evening as we study now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 1903. 1903, Ellen White said, The leading points of our faith as we hold them today were firmly established. The whole company of believers were united in the truth. And as she's talking about the origins, the beginnings of the Advent movement, the principles of truth that God has revealed to us are our only true foundation. They have made us what we are. The lapse of time has not lessened their value. That's the following year, 1904. Also in 1903, the record of the experience through which the people of God passed in the early history of our work must be republished. Well, we're going to uh, publish it uh, audibly and uh, visibly. We have some books, DVDs, a lot of materials over here on the table that uh, you will, if you don't already have copies of, want to have them. We're republishing what the people of God in our early history experienced. Many of those who have since come into the truth are ignorant of the way in which the Lord wrought, how he worked. So we, we want to review that quickly this evening. In 1905, she said, we are to repeat the words of the pioneers. This is 1905, some years after Desire of Ages, 1898. 
And there's no misgivings about what the pioneers, what the early uh, message of those who wrote and experienced after the Great Disappointment, the formation of the uh, Advent movement and the work. No embarrassment about what they believed. Their words should be repeated. They knew what it cost to search for truth as for hidden treasure. I, I think many of us have experienced that, haven't we? The Bible has become a new book to me. I'm reading it through all over again and again because now with this new perspective, new under, understanding of the relationship, it's jumping out at me everywhere I look. Hidden treasure. And I want to find more. I know there's more in there. You learn something new every day. The word given to me is, let that which these men have written in the past be reproduced. So we're going to look at what some of these uh, had to say. Not one pin is to be removed from that which the Lord has established. Where shall we find safety unless it be in the truths that the Lord has been giving for the last 50 years? In 1905, she started making a lot of these comments. There must be five, six times she said, the last 50 years. What would that be? 1905? 1855? So we're going to look over the span of 50 years. What was said by these early pioneers that Ellen White said should be republished? We need to say again, remind ourselves of the history uh, that, we ex that uh, our movement was founded on. 50-year period. Stephen Haskell, 1904, said that such men as Elder James White, J. N. Andrews, Uriah Smith, J. H. Wagner, they did not dare present the truth to the people until they had made it a special subject of prayer. Thank you, Frank, for reminding us the need of prayer. We need to pray a lot more and speak less, I believe, sometimes. And the spirit of prophecy had set its seal to it. So before they would dare speak anything, they sought the counsel of God's word and his messenger. James White, 1868. Neither are the Father and the Son parts of the three one God. They are two distinct beings, yet one in the design and accomplishment of redemption. In 1881, now we've, we've jumped to the end of his life, one of the last things he wrote, the Father was greater in that he was first. The Son was equal with the Father in that he had received all things from the Father. Isn't that true? We hear, we're reminded of the many times that Jesus said that all things had been given to him from the Father. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Knowing that his time is, was at hand, and that the Father had given all things into his hand, John 13, 3. Uh, the Father has delivered all things into my hand, Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Uh, many texts that uh, speak of that. John Loughborough, 1861. We're jumping around in these early years. Almost any portion of the New Testament we may open which has occasion to speak of the Father and Son represents them as two distinct persons. The 17th chapter of John is alone sufficient to refute the doctrine of the Trinity. Ellen White, later in the, uh, the early 1900s, when she had a lot to say, pointed out that the 17th chapter of John ought to be our church creed. And she recommended that for our consideration study. J. N. Andrews, 1869, and as to the Son of God, he would be excluded. He's speaking about who is Melchizedek? And uh, that was the question. For he had God for his father. This is the Son of God. And did at some point in the eternity of past have beginning of days. You remember what it says uh, about Melchizedek in Hebrews, that he was without father or mother without beginning of days or end of years. Joseph Frisbee. Don't hear about Joseph Frisbee much, but uh, he also wrote in Review and Herald. This is quite early, 1854. 
in accordance with the doctrine that three very and eternal gods are but one God, how may we reconcile Acts chapter 10, verse 38? How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost. First person takes the third person and anoints the second person with a person being at the same time one with himself. This was frequently uh, uh, pointed out and uh, one of the arguments that uh, was early made. Some have question whether they had a proper understanding of the Trinity. Uh, sometimes they spoke of three persons and one person. We'll see that later. But generally it's the orthodox. Of course, you have a spectrum of different uh, understandings and different varieties, different flavors of uh, Trinitarian uh, thought. M.E. Cornell, the mass of Protestants believe with Catholics in the Trinity, immortality of the soul, consciousness of the dead, rewards and punishments at death, the endless torture of the wicked, inheritance of the saints beyond the skies, sprinkling for baptism, and the pagan Sunday for the Sabbath, all of which is contrary to the spirit and letter of the New Testament. John Mattison, 1869. Christ is the one literal Son of God, the only begotten of the Father. He is God because he is the Son of God. And this was uh, the appeal that because he was the literal Son, he inherited the nature of his Father. And that was a consistent theme throughout all of these Stephen Haskell again, back in the ages which finite mi mind cannot fathom, the Father and Son were alone in the universe. Christ was the first begotten of the Father, and to him Jehovah made known the divine plan of creation. That was 1905. That's quite a, a later one. Uh, R.F. Cottrell, God hath only immortality. He's quoting from 1 Timothy 6.16. He is the one fountain from which all life is derived. But he has given this prerogative to his son, that he may give life to them that believe. And then he refers to John 5.26. We're going to see this over and over. John 5.26, 1 Corinthians 8.6 were the two texts repeated many, many times. 1864. Also, Cottrell had a lot to say. He had some very good things, so we will mention several. A few years later, 1869, the Trinity or the triune God is unknown to the Bible. And I have often, I have entertained the idea that doctrines which require words coined in the human mind to express them are coined doctrines. Today, we still hear much said the same. It's an assumed teaching. It uh, cannot be expressly stated in Scripture, but we, we understand that it must be so in uh, that kind of thinking. If the Scriptures say he is the Son of God, I believe it. If it is declared that the Father sent his Son into the world, I believe he had a Son to send. The sequence is uh, quite obvious. As you read 1 John, particularly chapter 4, twice there, sending the Son... John 3, 16, obviously, uh, he sent his son. Hebrews uh, speaks of the son being sent. Uh, several places, the sequence is important. Joseph Bates, respecting the Trinity, I concluded that it was an impossibility for me to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, was also the Almighty God, the Father, one and the same being. Uh, 1868. A.T. Jones. 1899. This is uh, 10 years, 11 years after the uh, 1888 conference, which we first think of. When you think of Jones and Wagner, you think of 1888. They were writing in the Signs of Times out in the West Coast in California for uh, some time before that. Here's what he said 11 years after uh, Minneapolis. He was born of the Holy Ghost. In other words, Jesus Christ was born again. He came from heaven, God's firstborn, to the earth, and was born again. This thought is going to be brought up and, and uh, taken by Prescott, we'll see later on. A.C. Bordeaux, that Jesus Christ is God himself, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, 
are one identical being. Hence, in describing one, we describe the other. Certainly this is doing no better by the Son than by the Father. One. Yet this constitutes the Christian's hope as taught by popular ortho orthodoxy. Heaven save us and, the, and open our eyes that we may see the truth. G, uh, George Butler, who was General Conference uh, President at the time of the 1888 um, General Conference in Minneapolis, said the following year, 1889, it is certainly remarkable that thus far we have not had to change a single position decidedly taken after faithful investigation. Everyone stands firmly after more than 40 years of opposition from bitter opponents. And it was going to be just a few years later that Ellen White would start speaking of 50 years. Also October 1, the angels are sons by creation, just as Adam was, who was created a little lower than they. But Christ is the only begotten Son of God, having by inheritance a more excellent name than they. This is the, George Butler didn't say this, but it's in the same issue in the Sabbath School notes for that, uh, that week. But he did go on to say in August of 1898, though two beings distinct in individuality and person, this is speaking of the Father and the Son, they are one in all else, perfectly united in methods, character, love and goodness, power, prescience. We don't use that term very often, but it means foreknowledge, pre-conscience, pre-awareness. Foreknowledge, one of the uh, attributes to, of divinity, deity, to see into the future. Love and goodness, power, prescience, and might. Yet Christ himself says, my Father is greater than I. Sustaining the relation they do as the Father and the only begotten Son, precedence in a certain sense must necess necessarily be conceded to the Father. This implies superiority in du duration and rank. We have therefore, therefore, a divine, a glorious, and omnipotent Savior, full of majesty, love, benignity, uh, who has undertaken our salvation. Now, notice this, that because the Son inherits everything from the Father, therefore, we can exalt the Son as having fully divine, all-glorious, omnipotent. He has all the attributes of the Father, full of majesty, love, gracious kindness. <clears throat> Joshua V. Hines. Now, this is uh, quoting him at an earlier date, uh, actually before uh, 1844, 1835. There is one living and true God, the Father Almighty, who is unoriginated, independent, eternal, the creator and supporter of all words, and that this God is one spiritual intelligence, one infinite mind, ever the same, never varying, and that Christ is the Son of God, the promised Messiah and Savior of the world. You can hear in that the reference to 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Judson Washburn, this is later, almost 1940, 1939, the Father, the Ancient of Days, is from eternity. Jesus was begotten of the Father. Jesus, speaking through the psalmist, says, The Lord Jehovah, the Lord, all caps, Jehovah, has said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Uriah Smith, in 1882, The Scripture nowhere speaks of Christ as a created being, but on the contrary, plainly state that he was begotten of the Father. This need to, dis to distinguish between begotten and created uh, has to be repeated many times because that is often the confusion. Uh, questions would be sent in uh, and indicate that they understood that to be the same and they would have to clarify, straighten that out. That they're 1884, C.C. Lewis, I hadn't heard of him before either, but in the Review and Herald, over a, a couple of issues, end of August, uh, first part, uh, in August and September, in the exact times known only to himself, God, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, Lord of lords, 
who only hath in immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, no man is seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Again, 1 Timothy 6, verse 16 and 17, shall make manifest the full glory of the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he quotes that text. Now he says, God himself is the only source of life. He only hath life in himself. And he has given to the Son to have life in himself. So he's combined 1 Timothy 6, 16 with John 5, 26. And uh, life in himself, the only one who has the immortality, and he has given that immortality that self-existent life. Here's W.W. W. Prescott. He has this uh, same idea that we heard with A.T. Jones, 1896. As Christ was twice born, once in eternity, the only begotten of the Father, and again here in the flesh, thus uniting the divine with the human in that second birth, so we, who have been born once already in the flesh, are to have the second birth being born again of the Spirit. I think that's beautiful. He went on in uh, Sam School Lesson Studies, 1902. It was um, April 19. The great controversy on earth. And he uh, begins there speaking of uh, Satan and, and his Lucifer's ambitions, Isaiah 14, to be like the Most High and thus to be light itself, Lucifer being the light bearer. But he didn't want to bear, be the light bearer. He wanted to be the light, which, uh, of course, is what 1 John 1, 5 says, that God is light. And the source of light. Since light is only a manifestation of life, John 1, 4, Jesus is that light which came into the world, that lighteth every man who comes into the world. Since light is only a manifestation of life, this was the demand of a created being to be a source or fountain of life which could only be granted to the begotten Son, and again, the appeal is to John 5, 26, one with the Father, the real fountain. And he mentions Psalm 36, 9. That God is the fountain of life. Prescott went on. He had some other interesting things. In 1919 at the uh, Bible... The Bible Conference of 1919, for as the Father has life in himself, everyone's referring to John 5, 26, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. Christ's attributes, what he was, was subordinate to the Father in this sense, that it was derived from the Father, but not that it was any less. That's important. That ought to sink in. Being derived does not mean that the Son is any less divine than his Father. His nature is exactly the same as the Father, right? The same glory, the same power that the Father had. But you can't put those things to cold reasoning after our manner of dealing with such things and say that the one who derived is just as great as the one from whom he derived it. John uh, Wagner, which was the father of Ellet J. Wagner, said they take the denial. He's talking about those who have uh, defended or uphold the Trinitarian doctrine. And when someone denies that, it to be equivalent to a denial of the divinity of Christ. Were that the case, we would cling to the doctrine of the Trinity as tenaciously as any can. But it is not the case. Much stress is laid on Isaiah 9, 6 as proving a trinity. The advocates of that theory will say that it refers to a trinity because Christ is called the everlasting Father. If so, how is he the Son? Or if he is both Father and Son, how can there be a trinity? For a trinity is three persons, but the text speaks of two, Son and Father. To recognize a trinity, the distinction between the Father and the Son must be preserved. Christ is called the second person in the trinity. But if this text proves a trinity or refers to it at all, it proves that he is not the second but the first. And if he is the first, who is the second? 
there are some very early that turned the doctrine of the Trinity into tritheism. And instead of these, these divine persons brought in three collateral coordinate and self-originated beings, making them instead three absolute and independent principles, which is the most proper notion of three gods. The great mistake of Trinitarians in arguing the subject is this. They make no distinction between a denial of a trinity and a denial of the divinity of Christ. They see only two extremes between which the truth lies. Uh, James White also said this, uh, battling constantly the problem of going to one extreme, Unitarianism, one, one, or the other extreme, and it's in between they always maintained. So it would be something like that. Now, he didn't feature, this is my diagram, but on one side, the, Trinitar the Trinity is the defense of divinity. If that be the case, then no divinity in their mind would be no, divin no trinity, no divinity. But the truth, Wagner said, was somewhere in between. His son, 1890, and this is two years after the 1888 conference, and his book, which we believe is probably the best indication of what the content of the presentations, because they have not been preserved, uh, the nature of what that was presented there in 1888. We know that Christ proceeded forth and came from God. John 8.42. This is also a frequently cited text. But it was so far back in the ages of, ex of eternity as to be far beyond the grasp of the mind of man. As the son of the self-existent God, he was by nature all the attributes of deity. It is true that there are many sons of God, but Christ is the only begotten Son of God, and therefore the Son of God in a sense in which no other being ever was or ever can be. Now that certainly makes him unique. The fact that Jesus is spoken of as the only begotten Son of God should be sufficient to establish a belief in his divinity. As Son of God, he must partake of the nature of God, as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he all given to the Son to have life in himself. So this John 5, 26 was a very important text. Also, 1889, in arguing the perfect equality of the Father and the Son and the fact that Christ is in very nature God, we do not design to be understood as teaching that the Father was not before the Son. The idea that a father and a son, which indicates priority, sequence, one must come before the other. He says that you can, in his thinking, his understanding so far, that perfect equality, now that's different than absolute equality, but it's uh, perfect equality in nature, uh, was based on the concept of the Son from the Father. It should not be necessary to guard against this point, lest some should think that the uh, Son should be uh, as soon as the Father. Yet some go to this, that extreme, which adds nothing to the dignity of Christ, but rather detracts from the honor due him, since many throw the whole truth away rather than accept a theory so obviously out of uh, harmony with the nature of Scripture that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. He was begotten, not created. He is of the substance of the Father. If you're familiar with the uh, Nicene Creed, that language is in the Nicene Creed, isn't it? God of God, light of true, uh, true God of true, God, light of light, um, of the same substance. R.A. Underwood uh, wrote uh, an article in the Review and Herald the year after 1888, borrowing much, if you read through Christ Our Righteousness by uh, E.J. Wagner, much of what was in this article is uh, taken right out of that. Again, John 5.26 is uh, quoted, which shows clearly that the Son of God received his life and all his mighty creative power as a gift from the Father. God the Father delegated to the beginning of creation, of course that's referring to uh, 
Revelation 3.14, the firstborn of every creature, Colossians 1.16, uh, his own name and his own almighty, creative, life-giving power. We are in ignorance of when this was done. We only know that it was in the eternity of the past, before the worlds and all that in them is were created. That's a reference to uh, Proverbs chapter 8. W.H. Littlejohn looks like he might be blind, uh, probably was, was writing, and this is a response to a question. They had, he was doing the answer, question and answers column in the review in, in 1883. Someone asked, can you please show us where the Seventh-day Adventist belief is in Scripture that Christ was a created being? So here was another uh, uh, example of how they had to con constantly uh, show that that's not the same as begotten, created begotten. You are mistaken, little John begins, in supposing that Seventh-day Adventists teach that Christ was ever created. They believe, on the contrary, that he was begotten of the Father and that he can properly be called and worshipped as such. They think that it is necessary that God should have antedated Christ in his being in order that Christ should have been begotten of him and sustained to him the relation of son. He goes on, they hold to this distinct personality of the father and son, rejecting as absurd that feature of Trinitarianism which insists that God and Christ and the Holy Spirit are three persons and yet but one person. Uh, M.C. Wilcox, which was brother uh, to F.M. Wilcox, uh, also uh, in 1919, the same year of the Bible Conference, wrote a, a little booklet called Questions, to, uh, Questions and Answers. And in the, this section here, dealing on this subject, it is always safe to confine ourselves to the terminology of the word. And we never find these expressions, he's talking about uh, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, among the Bible terms. Why try to name them in a way that the Bible has not? So that was, he's prefacing his introduction, and he continues the next page. The Spirit is common to both the Father and the Son, and all God's works are operated through the power of that Spirit the great life of God. What is implied in only begotten Son of God, we do not know. But this only begotten Son of God, who proceeded forth and came from the Father, John 8, 42, was given and given for sinners, given in the beginning, the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. He goes on to talk about this giving of the Son. We do not understand that the expression the only begotten Son of God refers to our Lord as a human being. Uh, there is some who take that position today. Oh, the Son of God, that means when he was born here in the flesh. He became the Son of God. It would seem as if John 3.16 would exclude this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son the giving was not when he was born of a woman. The giving was that he might be born of a of woman. The reason why the scriptures speak of the Holy Spirit as a person, it seems to us, is that it brings to us and to every soul that believes the personal presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, in John 14, 18, I will not leave you desolate or orphans. I will come to you. He tells us in verse 16 how he will come. Father will give you another comforter, that he, the Father, may be with you forever. In verse 23, he declares that the Father and he will come to the man who loves him and keeps his word, and that they will make their abode with him. Both the Father and the Son come by the Holy Spirit. James Edson White, James and uh, 
Alan White's son in 1909 wrote, uh, Christ is the only being begotten of the Father, which goes right along with what Ellen White would say in you know, Patriarchs and Prophets, great controversy in her describing these early events that the Son of God was, there was no other being in the universe, no other being uh, that was allowed to go into the councils, uh, special privilege to in enter the councils of God. Uh, William C. White, Willie White, uh, right in this, this is the letter, everyone's read the letter in 1935. The spirit without individuality was the representative of the Father and the Son throughout the universe. It was through the Holy Spirit that they dwell in our hearts, John 14, 23, and make us one with the Father and with the Son. I hadn't heard of C.F. McVeigh, is it McVeigh? McVeigh? Christ, the Anointed One. This is 1918 Western Canadian Tidings. Christ, the Anointed One, was not brought into existence when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2. Christ was begotten of the Father sometime before the period known as time, Revelation 3.14. And he was begotten again at his resurrection, Acts 13.3-34. This was in the uh, 1926 issue of the uh, Signs of the Times. George Rhine, not a familiar name, but uh, just to illustrate how it continues down through the decades. Of course, Jesus is the express image of the Father so that he would say in a very real sense, I and my Father are one. Now they are one in respect to life or immortality. Here we are not left to in inference. Jesus himself testifies as follows, as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself, John 5, 26. Ah, uh, we have a Savior to whom eternal life, immortality, is original, native, inherent. Original, this is way after uh, 1997, I think, was the first uh, occurrence of original, unborrowed, underived. Original, native, inherent. Uh, J. Adam Stevens, immortality is a fact, but it is an inherent characteristic of God alone which he has shared with the Son, Jesus the Christ. It was Christ himself who said, for as the Father has life in himself, so has he given the Son to have life in Everybody is saying this. They're all quoting it. 1929, G.W. Stone, also same year, now in the Review and Herald. The thought that in him were all things created indicates that when the Son was begotten of the Father in the days of eternity, all the power of creation was in him. And when the time came and the divine purpose for its accomplishment, he simply spoke all things into existence. He's the Word. He spoke by the Word of the Lord. God's thought made audible. W.G. Turner also uh, signs the Times, same year. We find the Son to be equal to the Father in everything except that which is conveyed by the terms Father and Son. He is equal to the Father in that he shares to the full the Father's infinite power and wisdom and love. But inasmuch as the Father possesses these divine attributes from himself alone, whereas the Son possesses them as derived from the Father. Derived. <laughs> the source of all things, the Father. In this real sense, and in this sense only, the Father is greater than the Son. In this sense only is the Father greater. The Son is just as equal as his Father in all things, except that the Father is first. Signs of the Times, 1932. This, uh, the Signs Question Corner was hosted by William Worth. And in this issue, uh, he addressed a question on the origin of Christ I'm going to jump down. You, you can read through all of this. Uh, I don't know if you can. Can you read that back there? 
He's before all things. Uh, he is first. Being first in distinction from creation, he's also necessary, necessarily first in relation to the creation of priority time, so on. Here's uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 uh, featured. Philippians 2, 6, uh, he was in the form of God, thought it not e uh, robbery to be equal with God, equal in form. Uh, Moffat makes this even um, expression, the firstborn of creation. He says, born first before all creation. And uh, he liked that preference. The word born is used because in contrasting the creation with his creation, it postulates the nature of the Lord's origin. He was not created as were creatures, but was born out of God as God. And so is of the same nature as the Father. And this is becoming more and more clear as they repeat this concept. Just as the human son is born human by nature because his father is human, so the divine Son of God is by nature born God. In what way we may not attempt to explain, and that's not our purpose to try to explain the manner or how, we want to identify who. So identity is, is crucial. The Divine Son is by nature uh, born God because his Father is God. Uh, this seemed to happen frequently. Another question, was Christ born of God in heaven before he was born of the Virgin Mary? This question was asked. Uh, the same thing, you can see it here. He answers much the same. All attempts to answer this utterly profitless. The word born is used because in contrast, that's the same wording. I think he lifted it right out of it, uh, the previous one. We talking about Godspeed again. In August 23, uh, 1932, another question, Paul, uh, let's see, this was uh, in Wisconsin, about the immortality of Jesus, 1 Timothy 6.16, 6, right? Uh, the first person of the Godhead, the Father. If question, uh, the questioner keeps in mind, he will have no difficulty with this statement that it is God the Father that is being spoken of here. It does not predicate at all that Christ as God was ever mortal. That point being made here is that in an absolute sense, endless life is an essential property of the Father. The Expositor's Greek Testament has this helpful comment on this, and he, he quotes from this uh, source, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are co-eternal with the Father. Well, that's the kind of language that you would expect from uh, an alternate source. We didn't use this kind of language, but he, the point is, he wants to point, uh, go on, but their life is derived and dependent on his. This is expressed De, uh, it's expressly declared by Christ himself as the Father has life. Even they, this is others than Adventists, are, are quoting John 5, 26. So he has given to the Son to have life in himself. In 1934, I don't know, I didn't know this name either, G.F. Enoch, uh, Eastern Tidings, Southern Asian Division. This day have I begotten. These uh, studies in Hebrews, and they're already up to Number five, and they've just gotten to Hebrews 1, verse 5. <laughs> in our text in Hebrews, we find revealed our Lord's unique relation to God the Father and also his unique mode of derivation from the Father. That just amazes me that they continue to, to speak of this. In another place, Paul uh, calls Jesus his own son. Romans 8, 3, thus separating him from all the created and intelligences by an infinite gulf. There is light for us in the description here given of the mode of the Son's derivation. What's the light? The earthly relationship of father and son so familiar to the human family is the symbol taken to illustrate this profound truth. Here it is. But the Son is subordinate to the Father. He has life in himself, but this attribute is the gift of the Father. Jesus himself said, the Father is greater than I. 
And see also 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 23, Christ is God's. And 11, 3, the head of Christ is God. 15, 28, he who put all things under his feet, except he is accepted. Uh, at when, the end, when he has uh, subdued all things, then shall he give the kingdom uh, back to the Father and be subject to him that uh, God may be all in all. That's uh, 15, 28, 27, 28. The subordination is directly traced to the derivation of his life from the Father. John 5, 26, uh, 6, 51. Uh, I live by the Father. And yet the Son shares with the Father all those attributes that distinguish God, the Creator from man, the creature. John 1, 1 to 4. We therefore feel constrained to conclude that He is the eternal Son of the eternal Father. 1937, Review and Herald, Sonship and Deity of Christ. Uh, talking about uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, Christ was indeed the very Son of God in every respect. He bore the likeness of His Father, the express image of His person. Man is created in the image of God after His likeness, but the Son, begotten of the Father, bore the express image of His person. Uh, here's another one, uh, 1937. From whom was this power derived? How did Jesus speak of His quotes uh, John 5.21, as the Father raises up the dead, so the Son uh, has uh, power to give life to whom he will. And then the question is asked, where did he get this power? And it's John 5.26 uh, quoted that the Father has it in himself and he has given it to the Son to have it in himself. C.H. Uh, Watson, The Atoning Work of Christ, uh, it was a book that he wrote published by uh, Review and Herald in 1934, and our Savior that life that was lost through sin is restored, for he has life in himself to quicken whom he will. He is invested with the right to give immortality. He's invested. It was given to him, that right to give immortality. For as the Father, and John 5, 26 is quoted as again. J.L. Schuler, who uh, was a call porter in the early 1900s and gave a book to my great, my grandfather, uh, John Gent, on my mother's side. So I kind of have an, an affinity with J.L. Schuler, writing in the Review and Herald, 1939. In other words, Jesus has the power of an inherent life, inherited life, inherent life. He said, as the Father has given himself, has life in himself. He, these brackets are in uh, what he wrote, underived inherit, inherent life. So has he given to the Son to have life in himself. Dallas S. Young's, uh, 1945, we're getting down near, before any other creature was given life, God brought forth his Son, his only begotten Son, made of his own divine substance. This is the signs of the times. And in his express image, Christ was firstborn. The Son was given self-existent life. He was made immortal, that is, he was given perpetual life within himself. Uh, another uh, article in The Signs of the Times, 1944, by uh, Robert Thurber. Jesus was born again 19 centuries again. Here's this idea of being born again. Sometime in infinity before that, he was begotten of his Father. Whatever that means, and more than that, we do not know. And wise is the man who refrains from speculating on what has not been revealed about divinity. So we don't want to speculate how this happens. Our first birth was similar to his second birth. Our second birth may be similar to his first. Uh, where do you think you got those ideas? You think you've been reading Prescott, maybe A.T. Jones? Uh, uh, he is the first begotten and the only begotten. God has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, from the dead, 1 Peter 1, 3. Uh, another one in uh, Signs of the Times, 1945. Uh, I can't read that one either. Jesus, the Son of God, said, as we should expect a son to say, my father is greater than I. The son has life in himself, John 5, 26. So also has the father. But it is said of the life of the son that it was given to him by the Father. Son has an eternal existence. 
Proverbs 8 shows us that he existed before any of the created works of God. This is the standard that Scripture always uses. Before the world was, before the mountains, before the hills, before uh, anything else, before all things, he had an eternal existence. Now here's Dallas Young again, um, Signs of the Times, 1949. And in this, um, he speaks about the uh, Daniel 7, nine, the Ancient of Days, Son of Man coming the Ancient of Days. Here Daniel calls God the Father, the Ancient of Days. This would seem to indicate priority in point of time over any other being in the universe. He is the source of all light, life, light, and power. He enjoys absolute, unconditional immortality. He has life unborrowed and underived. Who? The Father. He's talking about the Father. That is to say, he is dependent upon no other for his continuance of life. John 5, 26, as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. There is no other in the universe who has underived life. The Father and the Son only have this self-existent, underived, original life. Uh, 1950. <clears throat> we're, we're, we're full full scope here now. Signs of the times. Uh, Jerry uh, Lean had God who only hath immortality. First Timothy 6:16 6, possesses inherent eternal life. The Father has given this eternal life to Jesus, as the Father has life. And he quotes it again. So there we have it. A <clears throat> hundred years. Believing in the Son of God, who has given been given to have life in himself from his father, the only potentate who only has immortality, the only true God, whom to know is life eternal. So I confess again, after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. You can see the consistency all the way through. There were other things changing during this time, but there was a unified belief published in our, our journals uh, for a hundred years. Let's all kneel. <clears throat> Again, Father, we thank you for the witness that you have given in your word the witness that was shared by those that have gone before us that speaks of you and your Son. We exalt both you, we exalt the Son, and we worship you both as an example of how we can learn to live the relationship, the subordination, the, the uh, subjection that the Son in loving um, re the love that he has for you as, as the Father and that you have given that through his example to us. We pray for that today that it may strengthen our, our uh, confidence in your word and how you are working and desire to work in each of our lives. We pray now for your spirit to come and to uh, Continue us uh, as we prepare for the Sabbath now, we pray in Jesus' name.